Okay, good morning everybody, um, thanks for the introduction. Today I'd like to talk about the Access Aircraft campaign uh, which we, for which we use the DLR Falcon, which you can see here taking off in Spitsbergen. And the main objective of this uh, experiment was to learn more about emissions uh, of anthropogenic activities in the Arctic, which are expected to increase in the Arctic in the near future. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the contributors to this work. Um, the measurements were mainly performed by DLR people, but we had great support from the Latmus group for the modeling uh, work in Access. Okay, Access is the acronym for Arctic Climate Change, Economy and Society, and it's a large EU project. And the motivation basically is that due to climate change, the Arctic sea ice decreases, and uh, as a result, this unlocks the Arctic Ocean, and this offers the possibility for human activities in the Arctic. So the main objective of the Access project is uh, to assess the opportunities as well as the risks of this Arctic sea ice decrease in different economic sectors, which are shipping, which are fisheries, and which are resource extraction. So actually there are a lot of industrial partners in this project involved who we'll look mainly on uh, technology developments for the Arctic harsh environment or uh, develop a better infrastructure, look at safety issues. But our work was mainly to look at uh, the impact of the emissions, basically shipping and oil and gas extraction have uh, on, on the Arctic troposphere. So resource extraction is already taking place in the Arctic, but there are still uh, large undiscovered oil reserves in the Arctic, mainly offshore. And uh, these oil and gas extraction facilities emit a, a large amount of uh, air pollutants, uh, basically due to several processes like uh, power generation, gas venting, flaring. And also we have to keep in mind the associated infrastructure because the extracted oil and gas has to be transported. So there's a recent uh, publication uh, which suggests that flaring, especially in Russia, is a high um, contributor to Arctic black carbon, but actually there are not very many measurements. So the only measurements available are here from the Prudhoe Bay, a large onshore field in Alaska. And it's clear that if you want to understand the impact of these emissions, we have to learn something about the emissions and therefore we need measurements. The other sector we are looking at is Arctic shipping. Basically, there are two main routes across the Arctic, which is the Northwest Passage along the Canadian, or mainly in Canadian waters, as well as the Northern Sea Route, mainly along the Russian seaboard. Uh, these two routes are very interesting for the shipping company because uh, you can save a lot of distance, up to 40% of distance, if you use these routes compared to the traditional routes through the Suez Channel. So, um, Actually, the Northern, or currently the Northern Sea Route is open for only two to four months per year, but it's interesting to note that the uh, transits of commercial vessels increased quite a lot uh, and steadily during the last uh, recent years. And we also have to keep in mind that uh, transport, uh, Arctic shipping is not only transport of commodities, but includes also tourism. Um, right now, uh, you can also already book a tour along the Northwest Passage or the Northern Sea Route if you just pay enough money. So this will increase as well. So the Northwest Passage uh, is not as accessible as the Northern Sea Route right now, but uh, last year one of the access partners managed to do the first commercial uh, ship transit. And of course, um, if you think we save a lot of distance if you use these routes, we will save also a lot of emissions. And this is very good for CO emissions, for example, so for the long-lived traces. But the question is, uh, what is the impact of the short-lived com compounds, we, which are in this case dire directly released in the Arctic? So to study these emerging uh, pollution sources, we used the DLR Falcon, and um, the Falcon was equipped with a large suite of trace gas and aerosol instruments, and we had uh, different forecast tools provided by the Latmus group um, from small-scale small scale models like uh, FlexPower Wolf, but we had also MAC products for the forecasts. 
So during the access campaign, the Falcon was based in Andenes in northern Norway uh, for three weeks in July. You can see the flight patterns here, color-coded by altitude, and we performed nine, fli nine flights to, to characterize the Arctic pollution sources. Um, what is important to mention is that we did not only look on ship at, at ship emissions and oil and gas platform emissions, but or because or if you want to uh, evaluate the impact of future emissions on the Arctic, we also have to have a better understanding of the current state of Arctic air pollution. And for that reason, we also performed flights to study, for example, the Kola Peninsula plume, which was transported into our measurement area, and we also did some flights to study Siberian biomass burning pollution. So I will come back to this later. So first of all, I'd like to show some results from the oil and gas platform flights. So actually, the uh, landscape of Arctic oil exploration changes rapidly. During the time of our measurements in 2012, the most northern area with a lot of activities was here in the Norwegian Sea area. So there was not much going on north of Andenes. This changed in between. But for that reason, we focused on, on, on that area. And you, here you can see a um, cockpit view. Uh, yeah, the cockpit view out of the Falcon when we approach the facilities in the Norwegian Sea area. Um, actually, you, you can see that there's a lot of activity, much more than we'd expected, honestly, because there were not only the fixed platforms, but there were also mobile drilling rigs, there were uh, shuttle tankers moving around, storage tankers and rescue vessels. So this complicated the flight uh, a little bit, because there was also helicopter activity. But at the end, we managed to sample a lot of plumes and could assign the plumes to nine different installations. And we performed the flight also in close cooperation with Statoil, um, who confirmed normal operating modes for most of the installation we probed. So this here shows you the flight check of this flight, a, a little bit messy, it's color coded by measured nitrogen oxides, and um, the wind direction is was from north, northeast, and you can see clear enhancement down, uh, downstream of all the facilities. So the right-hand side here is a time series uh, exemplary for the flyby at the ASCAD facilities, which are an uh, oil production platform, a uh, gas production platform, and a storage tanker. What you can clearly see is that um, the plume composition differs a lot depending on the type of facilities. For example, we see high SU2 as well as high, non, uh, high number of non-volatile particles and an increase in black carbon uh, in the, in the Asgard C plume, which is a, a storage tanker, which is just anchored nearby the production platforms. In contrast, uh, the SO2 is low in these plumes from the production platforms, but we see an increase in the nucleation mode. The, this indicates new particle formation, and since SO2 was below the detection li limit of a few PPT, this points to um, particle formation due to uh, vented VOCs during the production, uh, during the extraction. So from these qualitative impressions, we want to get to quantitative numbers. And for this, we use simulations uh, with the FlexPert model. So we did FlexPert forward runs, starting at the installations. And here you can see exemplary time series um, for the flyby here. In black are the measurements, and the colored plumes here are from the simulations. And uh, so the distance to the facilities was a few kilometers or up to a few tens of kilometers, and the plume width itself was also only a few kilometers. And you can see that's a really good agreement between the measurements and the, and the modeled plumes. So, and if you tune now the emission rate in the model so that it matches the measured peak area, you can get to uh, real numbers, uh, so to get emission estimates. And that is the on, that's the ongoing work from Jin Kim, um, and this is summarized in this uh, figure here, and this also shows what I said before, we see clear differences in the chemical composition of the different facilities. So basic aim at the end is to compare these as emission estimates with emissions reported uh, by the facilities itself. 
Okay, then we did a few flights on ship emissions. So we looked at different types of ships, uh, more smaller ships, uh, because these are expected to operate in the Arctic, uh, but also fishery vessels as well as um, a cruise ship, for example. Um, Right at the beginning of the ca campaign, we did a so-called single plume study of the Wilson Nanjing, a mid-sized car cargo ship. And during these kind of studies, uh, we uh, first approach uh, the target ship and search for the fresh plume using the forecast and also the in situ in measurements on board. And then we start to meander back. Um, just to sample the plume uh, while it disperses in the atmosphere and sample it at different plume ages. So in this case, we managed to uh, sample the plume or to follow the plume up to 80 kilometers of distance, which corresponds to a plume age of uh, approximately three, three to four hours. On the right-hand side, you can see the measurements. I hope you can see it here. This is the NOx, and there was another ship traveling around uh, for that reason. There's also an increase on the right-hand side. So the basic idea of these kind of measurements is to improve the plume dispersion and the modeling and looking at chemical and aerosol aging within uh, the uh, WARFCAM model and also to study the regional impact. Um, this is ongoing work by Louis Morel and uh, in a first step he did a similar uh, approach which I explained before for the oil and gas platforms to get emission emiss estimates. So here you can see a comparison between, between the measured and the modeled plume. And in this case, he can compare his values uh, to a very nice emission inventory, the steam emission inventory provided by a Finnish group, uh, which has a very high temporal and spatial resolution. So you can see each single, or yeah, you can identify each single ship. So and a first estimate looks really, really good. So we have to see if this is true or if this happens also for the, for the other ships we sampled. Finally, as I've mentioned at the beginning, um, we also have to understand uh, the current Arctic air pollution. Um, and during earlier Arctic deployments in summer, especially during the polar cat deployments, we observed um, ongoing transport of middle latitude pollution into the Arctic. And I'm talking about summer, not spring, not Arctic haze, really during summer. And again, during the access campaign, we realized that there's a large CO plume coming across the pole, uh, approaching our measurement area, and this contained a lot of Siberian biomass burning pollution, and therefore we decided to design a flight to target this plume. So it was clear that we won't reach the center of the plume, but we wanted to do an indie vertical profile of this Siberian biomass burning pollution, and here you can see a curtain plot uh, of this flight track. And the main objective was also to learn something of the, of, on the black carbon distribution in these layers, because this was the first time that we had black carbon measurements on board the Falcon. So these profiles now uh, show you the mean vertical profiles of the two flights. And what you can see is an increase in black carbon as well as in CO. Um, so this is just the mean CO values in the layers were up to 300 ppb and black carbon uh, went up, up to a few, na a few hundred nanograms per kilogram. Um, so it's not very surprising that we see an increase here because we target this plume and this just tells us that we managed to sample the plume efficiently. But what is really interesting is that if you compare this with the campaign average, then you can see that it's quite similar. So the campaign average given in black here, these are the percentiles in gray, um, uh, this uh, campaign average includes all profiles, also those who were not specifically targeted uh, these biomass burning plumes. And this just tells us that we did not sample a very unique plume, but more a typical plume. And again, this confirms earlier observations during the polar cat uh, campaign, where we also observed this import of pollution. And this is summed up, for example, in the paper by Cassie Law. And I should point uh, to her poster on this uh, today in the poster session. Okay, to sum up, um, so we looked at emerging pollution sources and sampled uh, different type of uh, plumes from different type of oil and gas facilities and different ship emissions. Um, currently, we try to do emission estimates using a combination of measurements and modeling. Um, in our next step, uh, we, oops, 
in the next step, we want to do regional uh, modeling to understand the regional impact of these emissions. And finally, what I want to say is that we gained a lot of data during access. Uh, we learned a lot, but of course, this was only a snapshot of, of current emissions, only a few measurements on, on a few days. And this means we need more measurements, we need more model studies, and we also have to keep in mind that the emission patterns might change in the future, basically due to IMO regulations, for example, or due to technology developments. So that's it. Thanks.